Peter Lilly, good to see you. You were a Conservative MP from 1983 till 2017. You were in the Cabinet from 1990 to 1997. So I'm really looking forward to getting your reflections on uh, that period. So you served in the cabinets of Margaret Thatcher and John Major, very loyal Thatcherite. But when the day came when she had to depart, and the Conservative Party decided that this was no longer tenable, you were one of the cabinet ministers who had to go in and see her and effectively tell her the game was up. Just take me inside that room. Well, it was terrible because I hadn't discussed with any of my colleagues. I thought, rather cynically and wrongly, that they would all tell her, of course, Margaret, go for it, you know. And, and I wanted her to win, but knew that she probably wouldn't. So I was probably excessively brutal and said I didn't think there was any way she could win the second round. And she was obviously very shocked by this because I was her most loyal supporter. And she'd have me in first to sort of get some momentum. Uh, and there was a silence. And I said, you know, I would support her whatever she did, but I thought, in her own interest, she shouldn't stand again. And uh, I subsequently discovered that other members of the cabinet had said the same thing. If I'd known they were going to, I'd have been less brutal in what I said. I'd have softened the medicine, really. Were there any tears? Not then from her. There were when she finally left. And you can see that in the picture of her leaving Parliament, carrying a bouquet from people like me, of which is a copy of that photo, and I have it proudly on my wall. So when Margaret Thatcher did go, you served in the cabinet of her successor as Conservative leader and Prime Minister. That was the cabinet of John Major, who during his premiership, things were very fractious in the Conservative Party over Europe. He did a TV interview. And when that TV interview had finished, he thought he was speaking off the record to the journalist in question. The microphone was still on. And those remarks that John Major made became public. You were one of the cabinet members in John Major's government, labelled a, the word starts with B and it ends in D. Were you deserving of that title? Well, my mother was very upset at the thought of that <laughs> her integrity being impugned. I wasn't at all upset. And subsequently, uh, some months later, I was summoned by John Major after a cabinet meeting to discuss a, uh, a joint press conference we were giving. And there was an issue where another member of parliament had also accused his opponent of being an unmarried mother with five little bu And uh, in came an official and said, gave a bit of paper to John Major, and he said, oh, you better know this, Peter, uh, that MP has finally agreed to apologize for calling the children of his opponent bu I said, but Prime Minister, I didn't realize that was pejorative. It's the only time I've seen John Major lost for words. <laughs> Do you keep in touch with John Major? Are you friends? At no, I, I took it uh, in good heart and we seemed to get on terribly well in Cabinet. But when I read his uh, biography, of which he, autobiography, he sent me a copy, I realised he didn't really like me. <laughs> so there we are. Does it hurt at all when you read memoirs and you're in it and people are not very kind? Well, he's sort of kind but resentful. Uh, I mean, uh, respectful but resentful. No, it doesn't worry me at all in politics. You don't agree with everybody. I was just surprised he seemed to take it a bit personally, the fact that we disagreed on some issues, rather than it was just part of political life. Can you have friends in politics? You can, and some of my best friends are in politics, but my best, best friends are outside politics. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as I mentioned, you were elected to Parliament in 1983. You stayed until 2017, so you will have seen the rise and rise, really, of uh, the Conservative Party, and then the demise of the Conservative Party, the arrival of Tony Blair, and so many of your colleagues were gone in 1997. When could you see that coming? And do you see any parallels today? It was certainly absolutely obvious more than a year before the election that we were going to lose. I knew, my officials knew, uh, everybody knew. Now, it doesn't quite feel like 1997. It's somewhere between 1992, where we thought we were going to lose and won, and 97, where we knew we were going to lose and lost. So I don't know which it's going to turn out next time. It, it could swing the 92 way if we're lucky. More likely, the opinion polls will be telling us something. Do you have any advice to uh, the, the, the government 
the leadership to, 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 to make it a 1992 rather than 1997. Yeah, and that is govern for the long term. If you're seen to be doing things which will only come to fruition in future parliaments, and maybe unpopular now, the electorate will respect you for that. They'll think, oh, they've got an agenda, let's see it through. If you're just doing things to try and minimise unpopularity before the next election or make yourself even popular before the next election, the electorate in this country are very savvy. They'll see through that and they'll say, well, they're over and done with, let's have another look. Um, so let's get the benefit of your wisdom of spending 34 years on those green benches. What has been the biggest change in politics or the role of an MP? What did you witness change during that time? Well, what I witnessed, and it's clear to everybody, but often ignored by commentators, is that members of parliament became much more rebellious, much more willing to vote against the party whip. In the 1950s, there were whole years when not a single MP voted against the party whip. From 1970 onwards, each successive parliament, more people voted, 4,000 voted against the recommendations of Mrs. Thatcher during her 12 years, more than 6,000 voted against Tony Blair during his 12 years, each gets more rebellious. And that's partly because of the uh, development of the internet and uh, emails, far more interaction between MPs and their constituencies, constituents, far less party loyalty. So you're always feeling, what will my constituents think about that, rather than uh, I've got to follow the party line. And that's a good thing up to a certain point. Beyond a certain point, it means that we become ungovernable. Lots of people say that the political environment, uh, the abuse directed to MPs, is something else these days. But actually, were you subject to a fair bit of abuse in your time in the Cabinet? Yeah. Yes, it was fairly horrible during the Back to Basics time, when, uh, because of some way that I think John Major actually was referring to Back to Basics in education, but it came back to sort of personal morality basics. And so everybody was fair game. And they used to come around my constituency, knock on my neighbour's doors, know any filth about Lily. Uh, fortunately, my neighbours kept all the filth they knew about Lily's secrets, so that was all right. Wow, wow. <laughs> um, and I, I'm interested in, in, in the job that you had for longest in government. That was Social Security Secretary from 92 to 97. You introduced incapacity benefit. That's money for people who can't work because they are sick or disabled. The number of claimants rose rapidly in the 90s. And one of the accusations that is made about that period is that during a time where the pits were closed, for example, then the, the numbers who went on incapacity benefit rose. And that was a way that you, the government tried to keep the unemployment figures lower. And it was a way to massage the figures. Do you have any truck with that argument? I don't think it was ever deliberate, but it happened, and it did mean statistically fewer people showed up as unemployed, but they weren't working. Uh, but by the time I got there, unemployment was coming down, but the number of people on disability benefit was going up, and it had trebled in a decade. And uh, part of the reason was there was no objective medical test of what constituted being disabled, and we introduced that, uh, and it was expected to be hugely controversial. Indeed. The uh, document I produced preparing for it, which I planned to send to the Prime Minister, was accidentally sent to the press exchange. And it spelled out warts and all, all the problems we were expecting. And when my official told me this, I thought it was a plot, but no, it wasn't. And I realised that. And actually, it made it much easier. Because once I'd spelt it out, each successive interview I had to do, and I had to do 18 over a weekend, sort of claw things back, became easier because people started phoning in and saying, and about time too, the chap losing next door to me, trains for the Olympic team, and he's on incapacity benefit. And it was realised that there was a lot of abuse and uh, misuse of the benefit. And more important, when people were helped back into work, they welcomed it. It gave them a sense of dignity and self-respect, which languishing on disability benefit indefinitely would not have been to their advantage or to their happiness and well-being. Final question. You are now in the House of Lords, Lord Peter Lilly. If Keir Starmer does become Prime Minister, he says he is scrapping the lot of you, the whole institution. What's the best reason he shouldn't do that? 
but it doesn't matter what the reasons are, he won't do it because it's been the plan ever since the legislation in 1912 to reform said it would be replaced by an elected assembly in due course. It won't because the House of Commons won't stand a rival chamber composed of elected people just like them, the second 11 basically, but with the claims to an electoral mandate who would conflict with them. And it would do away with something which the good argument for is it works. No one would invent it, but it works as a revising chamber. It doesn't work when it becomes a campaigning chamber, which it did during Brexit. But when it's revising legislation, when I was a Secretary of State and they revised my legislation, I'd first think, how dare they suggest any changes to it? It's perfect. But almost every occasion I accepted their revisions because they were usually sensible. It's just struck me since you said that. The immigration, uh, the illegal immigration bill, do you think that's going to have a tough time in the laws? It will have a tough time, but it will get through because if the Lords were to stop the measures to stop the boat people, that would be the end of the House of Lords. Then it would commit suicide. The public wouldn't stand that. Peter Lilly, fascinating trip down memory lane with you and to get your thoughts on some of today's political events too. Thank you. Pleasure.